This is a story that my dad has shared with me. He grew up in a small town called Stowe in Ohio with his parents and older sister. Across the street, there was a boy named Richard. He was around the same age as my father. He described him as a scrawny, red-headed troublemaker. He would spit on people as they walked by and even set a house on fire in the neighborhood, then blamed it on a kid who had special needs. Nothing he did as a child, however, would compare to the crimes he committed when he was only 19 years old. My dad had just started his sophomore year of college when he heard the news. Richard and his friends, Clinton and Kenneth, were throwing rocks off of a local bridge onto the interstate below when one of them struck a vehicle of 21-year-old Wendy Alfarendo. Her friend, 20-year-old Don McCreary was also in the car. They were sorority sisters who had just gotten off of work. At this time, Kenneth decided that he had enough and went home. This is when Richard and Clinton came up with their evil plan. Both of the young men approached the girls, offering them help and to give them a ride. They drove the girls to a nearby shopping center where they would call their parents. However, Richard and Clinton tied the girls' hands together and drove them to a field behind the mall where they were assaulted and tortured for three grueling hours. They would abandon their bodies in that field. They then decided they wanted to sell the girls' clothing and jewelry to make some extra cash. When Richard couldn't find a buyer for the items, he burned them in his backyard, which woke my grandparents. My grandfather called the police to report what he thought was yet another neighborhood disturbance from Richard. The police gathered the evidence, and after locating Wendy's abandoned car, they arrested Richard and began the investigation. Both Richard and Clinton were arrested and charged with the murders. They found the knife that was used in the homicide in Clinton's pocket when he was arrested, and some of the burnt items still had traces of the victim's DNA. Since Clinton was only 17, he was spared the death penalty and is currently serving life in prison. Richard, however, was given the death sentence. On October 14th, 2003, at 10 a.m., Richard Wade Cooey was executed by lethal injection. Wendy's family was present at his execution. Every time I visit my grandparents' house, I look across the street to where Richard used to live, and I can't help but get the chills. I'm glad I never met Richard, and I'm also glad that my dad was smart enough to stay away from him when he was growing up. At the time of writing this story, I'm 21 years old. I'm a female and I grew up in Ohio. This was one of the scariest nights of my life, and I'm still afraid to drive alone at night. At the time of this story, I was moving from a very well-known suburb outside of a main city to a small farming town with my family. My parents have never been the city type. They had both grown up on farms in the south and our whole family have lived in similar areas until I was about to enter high school. So you can understand how itchy they were to get back to their roots. I am the youngest of four. I have three older brothers, and I was the last to graduate. So the summer after my senior year, my parents decided this was a good opportunity for a change in scenery, since I was no longer tied down to a school district. The town that we were moving to was only around 45 minutes away. And instead of moving everything all at once and overwhelming ourselves, my parents opted to have us move our things every few days for around two or three weeks in the hopes that it would be easier for us to settle into the new house. 
the majority of the drive between the two towns is through main highways and was pretty much a straight shot. That's why this night was so terrifying, because I had made this drive nearly 50 times before this. I was too comfortable, and I allowed myself to let my guard down. I'm a pretty small girl, around 5 foot 3 and about 140 pounds, and even though my dad had taught me self-defense when I was younger, I'm the kind of person who freezes during confrontation or when I'm under pressure. It's very annoying. So it's a miracle I made it out of this alive. One night I decided to visit some old friends from the neighborhood that we were moving from. I would stop by on my way back to our new house. I can't exactly remember what time it was. I'm thinking it was around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Regardless, it was already very dark outside. Now even though Ohio is a northern state with pretty severe winters, in recent years the summers have been sweltering, even at night. I can also get a bit car sick in the heat with all the muggy air getting trapped in the car. At the time my car's AC was malfunctioning, so I usually drove home with my windows down. As I said it was pretty late, there weren't really any other cars on the road with me. I had seen about 10 cars during the entire drive. When I was just over halfway on the second main highway, there was an intersection with a gas station on my right, and nothing but a river and bridge on the left. It was a four-lane highway, and I was driving down the far right lane because of a turn that I had to make further up the road. This may seem like useless information, but it will be important later on. Nothing felt off initially. As I said before, I had made this trip several times before. I pulled up to a red light at this intersection, and I was playing some pop punk music with my left arm out of the driver's side window, when another car pulled up into the left lane next to me. Looking back now, it may have been a Dodge Charger, because I do remember it was a bright orange with a thick black stripe across the top of it. I was singing along to whatever song I had on at the time when I heard talking next to me. It wasn't so much that I heard them talking specifically about me or anything, but they were being quite loud and I have ADHD, so the extra noise made me turn my head. I regretted it immediately, because when I looked at the source of the noise, I saw a man sticking his head out of the passenger side window, staring directly at me and smiling. The look in his eyes made me want to vomit. Apparently he had been talking to me. I turned back quickly, knowing that if I kept eye contact any longer, he might think that I would be interested in chatting. I then heard the sound of a hand hitting a car door. Obviously one of the men were trying to get my attention. In the middle of all this, the front passenger started to whistle. You know, that signature cat call whistle that a lot of girls get just walking down the street. I started getting angry because I wasn't a fucking dog, but I kept my gaze forward, praying for the light to change so I could get away from these creeps. Now I know this sounds ridiculous that we were still sitting at this red light, but this particular traffic light had those really old and shitty light sensors. The ones that you have to back up and pull forward just to set off again. I didn't give these men any indication that I wanted to talk to them, but apparently this gave them more incentive to continue trying to get me to look at them. The front passenger and two other voices piped up. Hey baby, you want a ride? Why don't you hop in? We'll show you a good time tonight. Meet us at the gas station. We're not going to hurt you. Hey, why don't you talk to us? We just want to get to know you. I had heard enough, so I roll up my window and lock the doors of my car. Well, this apparently pissed off the front passenger, because before the window was up, I heard him shout, Fucking bitch! Before swinging his car door open. Before I knew it, he had gotten out of his car and walked over to the passenger door behind me, trying to pull on it. This is why explaining the specifics of my location was so important. I was basically trapped, because if I had tried to get out and go run to the gas station, or God forbid I had to run and cross the bridge on my left, I would have had to pass this other car 
and the man outside to get there. Obviously, getting out of the car and running would not be my best bet here. But at this point, I was so terrified, and I was trying to weigh all my options. Looking back, I now know this would have been a good time to get the fuck out of there. But I was literally paralyzed in fear. Again, confrontation freaks me out. I couldn't even feel my feet to hit the gas. And my hands were gripping the steering wheel so hard, I couldn't even feel them either. The man quickly realized that he wasn't able to get in and walked up to my window and began smacking it with his open palm. He was hitting it so hard that I actually thought I heard the glass creaking like it was going to shatter at any moment. When I still would not look over at him, he stopped hitting the glass just long enough to spit all over the window. I have no idea what gave me strength. Perhaps it was the fact that there was a chance he would have broken the glass and forced his way inside. But right as he lifted his arm again, and what looked like him about to drive his elbow into my window, I said fuck it and hit the gas. Running the red light and definitely exceeding the speed limit to get the hell out of there. I don't know what made me look back, but when I glanced up at my rearview mirror, I saw that all three of the men were now standing outside of the car. I saw one of them holding a small object. To be honest, I don't even want to think about what it might have been. I almost threw up from the anxiety and pretty much cried the rest of the way home. My parents own a restaurant in the area and are usually working very late. So when I got back home, only one of my older brothers was there. He did his best to try and calm me down but I don't think I slept at all that night. I know the fear was irrational because the men had not followed me home. But even so, I still locked my bedroom door just to make me feel a bit safer. I regret not being able to get a license plate, but as you might understand, I was so shaken up and just wanted to get out of there. I have never had an encounter like that again in that area. But granted, I found an alternate route through some side streets, so I usually avoid that highway altogether. This story doesn't directly involve me. It did happen while I was in the same house, and I probably would have been a victim if it hadn't been for our family dog, Sammy. In the early 80s, Columbus, Ohio was at the mercy of a man who was known as the Grandview Rapist. When he was caught, he was connected to over 60 crimes and was suspected in at least 40 more. One of the ways that he was getting into houses was by posing as a gas reader. He would target women who were alone with children. He would enter these houses and then threaten to kill the children if the women did not comply. I don't know how things worked in other areas, but here in Columbus, during the 80s anyway, letting a gas reader into your house was a normal thing. There were lots of meters in the basement, and it was the kind of thing you didn't really give a second thought to. One day there was a knock at our back door, and a man called out, Hello, I'm here to read the gas meter. My mom thought this was Kind of strange. Our driveway at the time wrapped around the house, and if he pulled far enough up, the back door would be closer than the front. So she figured that's what happened. She went to let the man in. No sooner had she opened the door, Sammy came charging into the room, frothing at the mouth and snarling. Now here's a little bit of background on Sammy. She was a black lab that we had rescued. Before we adopted her, she had been struck by a car and had been brought into the Ohio State University Vet Hospital. She survived her surgeries, but because of them, she was full of screws, splints, and plates. Any sort of physical activity would cause her great pain. She's also the most laid-back dog I've ever met. She did not growl. She didn't bark and she didn't really seem to care if she had never met you before or not. That was a dog who was frothing at the mouth in anger 
and jumping so hard at the back door that she not only pushed it closed, she actually broke the window on the door by slamming into it. All the while my mother was trying to hold her back, saying to the man, oh, I'm sorry, she's never like this. After several minutes, this guy runs off. He does not hop back into a work vehicle. He runs away on foot. It wasn't until after the man left that my mom began to think how odd this entire situation was. The man she saw was not wearing a uniform or had a clipboard. She didn't even see a name tag either. So she decided to report it to the police. The operator told her to lock all the doors and to stay on the line. Within minutes, there were a trio of cruisers out front and several more cops combing the area. Sammy was back to her normal self again, laying on her side and begging for treats whenever an officer came by. I was only two or three years old at the time, but I remember this part vividly. My mother gave a description of the man. This part was relayed to me later. It was a white male, fit, mid to late twenties, with sandy blonde hair. The officer then told my mother we owed our dog a steak dinner. He said that this suspect would stalk houses while husbands were away at work, and they also suspected that he would observe school bus stops to find women who were home alone with small children, and then knock on their doors pretending to be a gas man. There was a bus stop right outside of our front yard. I wish I could tell you that there was a happy ending here, but unfortunately there isn't. It was only when I was researching this story when I came across the most chilling discrepancy. The man who was convicted for these crimes was an older black man. My mother distinctly remembered seeing a younger white man. I know for a fact that several women have been violated in that same area around the same time. It was entirely possible that there was more than one man preying on women in that same area. To my knowledge, the man who my mother encountered at our back door was never caught. There's always a reason to be afraid.